Broadcasting from Salisbury University campus, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7, putting Delmarva first. Stay tuned for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. These days, we're treated to the turmoil in the Middle East with Islam caught in the crosswinds of the modern era. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. The most prominent images in American sea are those of jihadist organizations like the Islamic State or such countries as the Islamic Republic of Iran. During his 2016 campaign, we heard the president urging a ban on immigrants from Muslim countries. There is no doubt that Islam, particularly in the Middle East, is undergoing a struggle with the world of the 21st century, sometimes violently. In our studio this morning is Professor Muqtadr Khan. He is with the Political Science Department at the University of Delaware, also written a new book called Islam and Good Governance, a Political Philosophy of Islam. It looks at how Islam may have gone astray in developing such things as the Islamic State and a rich history that points to an alternative. And welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Don. So before we actually get into the heart of it, let's get some definitions of some terms here. Yeah. Um, so describe what is the Quran? So the Quran is the, the text, the, the canonical text on which Islamic faith is based. Muslims believe that the entire text is the literal word of God itself to reveal to Prophet Muhammad sometimes directly, sometimes through angel Gabriel. So Gabriel would come in the initial days, Gabriel would come and recite the verse to Muhammad in Arabic and make sure that Muhammad had memorized it. Sometimes the revelations came directly as an inspiration and other times they came through, most of the times through Archangel Gabriel. It took about 23 years for the Quran to be revealed and Muslims used the Quran to recite prayers and it is also a source of values and it explains why we are, who we are, what human relations should be with God. There are about 6,300 verses and most scholars think that 10% uh, of the Quran is uh, do's and don'ts, rules, uh, and 90% uh, of it is about uh, metaphysics, about spirituality, about the nature of God. Uh, God reveals a lot about himself in the Quran, the names of God, his attributes, uh, uh, his qualities, uh, and the nature of the world are all revealed in the Quran. So when we talk about Islamic State, for example, people use those 10% verses which are do's and don'ts as Islamic law and try to reduce Islam to just that. They are called verses of ahkam or instruction. And uh, so sometimes uh, I think when people become very politicized and Islam is politicized and then it is just reduced to the law, which is 10% of the Quran. So I, in my book I look at various other verses and right. other aspects of Quran in order to suggest that there is more to Islam than just Islamic law. Also, what is the Hadith? Hadiths are traditions. Uh, there are at the most 70,000 traditions of which Muslims consider about four to 5,000 as authentic. The rest are various degrees of, with various degrees of authenticity. Some may be fabricated, some may be weak. So hadiths are essentially what the Prophet said, what the Prophet did, and what the Prophet saw and did not forbid or, for, or forbid. So if the Prophet saw you playing soccer and said, don't play soccer, that becomes a hadith. If the Prophet saw you playing soccer and didn't say anything, that also becomes a hadith. It means he approves of you doing that. And then, of course, some of his actions, like having a beard, of the way he washed. Every time he entered a place, he put his right foot forward. These are all his precedents, and these are reported in hadith, and Muslims consider it as part of the faith. So the Quran and hadith, uh, essentially traditions of the Prophet, and divine revelations are the two fundamental sources of Islam. So, and then how does Sharia law then fit into all of that? Well, Sharia law, it depends on how you define Sharia law. Sometimes uh, people define, uh, in the simplest terms, when you ask a scholar of Sharia law, he says that Sharia law is essentially Islamic law. This is what God wants you to do. So the primary source is the Quran. So the Quran says, fast in the month of Ramadan. And so it's a Sharia law that you fast in the month of Ramadan. Uh, what do you do when you break your fast? Some of it is in the Quran, some are not. But then someone would have asked that question of the Prophet, 
and peace be upon him, and he would have answered that question. So we get the legal ruling now from the Hadith. Uh, can Muslims play chess? There's nothing in the Quran, but the Prophet said chess is very obsessive and kind of said it could distract you from other things, including God, so maybe don't play chess. So so that is how Sharia law is. But, but there are very limited things that the Quran and the Hadith directly address, uh, and then the rest of it is essentially opinions of medieval scholars who developed Islamic jurisprudence, who developed uh, uh, laws about how to derive laws. Uh, all of that is something that evolved after the uh, after really 150 years of uh, Muhammad Sallallahu passing away. So in that sense, Islamic law today, when we say what is Sharia, it is Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic rulings, Islamic sources, opinions of hundreds of scholars that have lived and passed, different divisions and sects that have emerged in Islam over a period of time. Some of those sects have emerged based on different uh, juristic interpretations of the law. So one of the things that struck me, and it's uh, something before, that is that, that Islam is struggling with how to deal with the modern era. It, certainly it's in the 20th century, but all the 21st century. Um, and the question about why isn't it as competitive as, say, for instance, the West, is that an accurate way to look at this revival, as it were, of Islam? Uh, because when I look at, for instance, the 20th century, one of the big breaks is obviously Pan-Arabism, which, which occurred, which was thought to be a, an answer, right, to, to the colonial period. That obviously has now disappeared. Is, is that the, one of the primary struggles, do you think? Well, in your question, you use Islam as a substitute for not just the religion of Islam, but, but also what we call our civilization of area. So mm -hmm. you're also using it for a region. Right. So Islam is both a religion like Christianity and also a civilization like Christendom. When you use the word Christianity, we often make this distinction. We say Christianity and the Christian world or Christendom. But often that distinction is not made. When you say Islam versus the West, I mean, it's a religion versus a direction, right? So we are talking about it. So when we talk about the challenges of the Muslim world, I prefer that term better, uh, faces, then yes, some of it is because of underdevelopment, bad governance in the Muslim world, lack of uh, security. It's one of the regions right now which has the most conflicts. Uh, we can see the Yemen war, potentially an Iran war, Iraq mess, Syria, and so on. Uh, this is a place which is generating the largest number of refugees at the moment. So yes, the, the Muslim world is suffering from many uh, issues of security and politics, but there's also a a enduring backwardness in terms of scientific development, in terms of institutional development. Even nation, nation are not fully developed, and so nation building is a big challenge in the Muslim world. And there have been various ways to try and explain why this underdevelopment exists. Uh, even I mean, Do you have some sense about why yes, that some is? Some people in the West have tried to blame it on Islam and said right. because Muslims have not reformed Islam and religion holds them back. And the same argument was made in the past about Catholics. And it's still used to explain the relative underdevelopment of southern countries in both Europe and in the Americas. But among Muslims, there have been broadly three responses. There are traditionalists who believe that the reason why the Muslims have lost their past glory and power is because they have abandoned Islam. So there is a call to return to Islam, and so re Islamic revivalism, because if you look at the Arab world before Islam, it was in a state of ignorance, underdeveloped, and tribal conflict. And once they embraced Islam, they became a great empire. So Islam brought glory to them once they abandoned the ways of Islam. So there are two or three types of movements, those who are puritanical, who just want Muslims to practice Islam in a ritualistic way, and then there are Islamists who want to bring back Islam in a political sense and say that we can only develop, we can only grow, we can only become uh, powerful if we uh, create Islamic states. And then there are those who say, it's, no, the, one of the reasons why Muslims have become very backward is because of abandonment of science. And you can see what happened to the Muslim world a little bit in the U.S. as we decide not to do scientific research, as we believe in creationism as opposed to evolution. So, so this abandonment of science will often translate directly into uh, relative 
backwardness. Other societies develop more powerful weapons, and so you fall behind, and your resources are not yours anymore. So that remains a challenge. But the critical thing is, uh, the thing that I'm trying to address in my book is, basically I'm answering two questions that two civilizations have posed. One, that primarily coming from West and other non-Muslim parts of the world as to if ISIS and Al-Qaeda are not Islam, then what is Islam? If this is not Islam, then what is Islam? So in my book, I try to talk about that there are many different ways of thinking of Islam and its role in the public sphere. Historically, Muslims have had different ways of thinking about it, and one way of thinking about it is, is what the Salafi jihadis portray, which is ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but traditional Islam has never been like that. Muslims have been mystical. Muslims have uh, made beautiful things from Taj Mahal to Blue Mosque. Aesthetics is a part of Islam. Compassion and mercy is a part of Islam. God himself says that I have sent Muhammad as nothing but mercy to all people, which would mean Muslims and non-Muslims. Muslims have interpreted that to understand that mercy not just to human beings but also to animals and to the environment, so to all worlds essentially. And the second thing is that there is a demand for Islam in the public sphere. Muslims want Islam to play a role in the political arena. And because the only developed answer so far is to impose Islamic law through the creation of an Islamic state, I'm trying to answer them and say, no, you can bring Islam into the public sphere, but there is an alternative way. There is a beautiful way of doing that, a, a political enterprise which is premised on aesthetics of values. And that is where Ahsan comes in. Ahsan means to do things beautifully. And the Prophet Muhammad said that God commanded Muslims to do whatever you do beautifully. So my question is, if we engage in politics, what will be the beautiful form of politics? And so for Muslims to engage in politics is not just to impose Islamic law on others or anybody else, but to develop institutions which will create an environment where society will become critical, where you will look at more of how can I improve myself rather than how can I force you to do this or that. Secondly, how can we be compassionate and merciful in our societies? How to be forgiving of each other? The third thing is to get away from identity politics. Identity politics is all about what can I do for myself? Whereas I'm trying to say uh, being a good Muslim means what can I do for you rather than what can you do for myself? So that is the, the trend and I lean very heavily on the Sufi tradition to provide an alternative way of thinking about both an Islamic state and an Islamic society. And so there are some technical aspects, like I talk about how Muslims can move from thinking just of national security to thinking about national virtue. We should start talking about what is our national virtue? What are we as, like for example, today we are talking about defending America's national security from all kinds of threats, from China, from Russia, from Iran, from North Korea, from Mexico, from Guatemala. That's all we are obsessed about. But as a society, we are not talking about who are we as a nation when it comes to values. What is our national virtue? Have you ever heard any politician talk about natural, national virtue? And I think that one of the things that we need to do as a society, as Muslims also, and anybody else, is to talk about what, what is our national virtue. And from a very specific perspective, Muslims have talked about shura as part of democracy in Islam, which is you develop rules through consultation. So I'm arguing that we should apply shura to also understand what is divine law. So it's not just revealed law. You see, many things claim that they are Islamic. For example, Pakistan says it's Islamic Republic. Iran says it's Islamic Republic. Saudi Arabia says it's Islamic Republic. ISIS said it was Islamic Republic. Afghanistan claimed. They are not identical. <laughs> they are not the same. So there are some so diverse these countries are, societies are, polities are, yet they say they are Islamic, which clearly shows that there are many ways of thinking about Islamic. So my argument is, why can't we envision a way of being Islamic, which is beautiful, which is what others would want to emulate? I mean, why would a true Islamic state would be that state where everybody would love to migrate to, like people want to migrate to America, because things are beautiful and wonderful in that society. Well, let me just, uh, we're getting to 
that solution, one of the things that I found revealing was that this idea of Islam being an imposition of rules, right, is that has a certain amount of um, theological backing in terms of people relying upon certain, and you mentioned some of the theologians, I guess, for lack of a better word, that really begin to establish that idea of fusing the state to Islam and then the imposition of rules, the imposition of, of, of uh, Islam. It comes along, it seems, that both of those, particularly the two of them, at times when the Islamic world is beginning to either find problems, either they're declining in terms of... Sure. Uh, so describe a little bit about and those theologians, because I think that's I think they're important in understanding where we're where, where we've been. See, there are two verses in the Quran. There are many verses, but the the ones that I pick to make my case. One verse is what is called Amr bil Maruf wa Nahyanil Munkar, where God tells Muslims that you should encourage good and forbid evil. So. Encouraging what is good and forbidding what is evil. So what do you, how do you define what is good and what is evil? So Islamic jurists and theologians ended up by saying what the Sharia demands is good, what the Sharia forbids is bad. So the good was defined in legalistic term. What is legal is good, what is illegal is bad. And so in order to, as the Quran says, encourage good, forbid evil, we need to make people adhere to Islamic law, which is good and forbid them from violating Islamic law, which is bad. But in order to do that, we need the mechanism of the state. So this verse itself becomes a justification for establishing an Islamic state, which will then encourage people to follow Islamic law. So the contemporary modern Islamic movements, uh, at least in English, they use the word implementation of Islamic law, which essentially means that the state will impose Islamic law. Therefore, when Iran became an Islamic state, it imposed uh, the chador on everybody, Muslim or non-Muslim. Even if uh, Mrs. Obama goes, Michelle Obama goes to Saudi Arabia, she's expected to wear a hijab because they are imposing Islamic law on everybody else within the territory. However, there are other verses in the Quran which say, like Rahafiddin, that is, there is no compulsion in faith. And there is another one which is, um, uh, Amr, that God has commanded all of us to do beautiful things while pursuing justice. So if justice is the end goal of Islamic law, as jurists claim, even that has to be pursued in a beautiful way. I can show you the opposite way. The way we are trying to implement our immigration laws are very ugly at the moment. It's mm -hmm. without a hassan. And some of them are saying, no, all we are doing is implementing laws. If you don't want us to do this, ask the Congress to change the laws, right? But it, this, even those laws can be implemented beautifully. You don't have to take away toothpaste away from children. So, so... These verses are ignored by those who advocate Islamic State because they're not interested in doing these things beautifully. So I'm arguing that even God has said that justice is not enough. When you pursue justice, you have to pursue it in the best possible way, which means forgiveness, compassion, mercy, so on and so forth. God has described himself as just. And Muslims believe, at least the Sufis believe, that God, before he created the universe, uh, made a commandment upon himself that his mercy would always prevail over his wrath. So God told himself that, yes, I will be more merciful. So even as a judge, God is going to be more compassionate than vengeful. And that is the principle. So even when we implement laws, we have to be compassionate. And I think ISIS has demonstrated that the, the way they would like to implement the laws are in the most po brutal possible way. I mean, their beheadings, the imposition of the laws, the way they have uh, essentially used capital punishment excessively, throwing people off buildings, uh, shooting them. This is the most ugliest demonstration of Islam, even if it is technically, legalistically justifiable by certain theologians. So my argument is that this is not what God intended when God said that he sent Muhammad as compassionate, as merciful. In fact, in one tradition, Prophet Muhammad said, you are not a Muslim, you are not a Muslim, you are not a Muslim if your neighbor is afraid of you. So this idea that people are afraid of Islam and Muslims itself renders that un-Islamic from based on tradition. So my argument is, can I at least offer 
a way of thinking about having Muslims. I'm not asking Muslims to abandon Islam. I'm saying practice your faith, but practice it in the most beautiful way. Don't ignore the beautiful aspects of the faith in pursuit of just law. That is not that is not all of Islam. There's much more to Islam than just laws. Well, let me ask you this, because one of the things that struck me is, and it's not an original idea, but that, uh, that there is a suffusion, it seems, in, in Islam with between the religion and the state. Um, and, and when I think about, for instance, Christianity, you didn't get that fusion until Constantine, and even then there was a certain sort of separation of this church. Uh, the state was really using the church, and of course, and of course, it, it fractures with with the refer with the Reformation, and we produces a country like the United States where they're they're yeah. separate. Is part of the problem this fusion of church and state, or the religion and state? I don't see it as a problem. Mm -hmm. This is the absence of secularism in in the religion. Right. It depends on the founding father, like. For example, Jesus, peace be upon him, was more like an undocumented worker today <laughs> in America. That's how we would treat him, right? He was a refugee in Egypt, a migrant. He mm. was poor, marginalized. Even though he was a rabbi, he was not an orthodox, like he was seen as rebel even in his own faith. So, but Muhammad, peace be upon him, finished his last 10 years as a ruler of Medina. And so, because whatever he said and did is also a source of Islamic law, his traditions. And because he ruled and governed and passed laws and fought battles, all of that uh, reduced the so-called secular space in Islamic imagination. Everything is sacred. So, so for example, if you remember Ashcroft, who mm -hmm. became Attorney General, I was watching his uh, uh, confirmation, and he basically promised that he would keep his values at home, his beliefs, and he would implement Roe versus Wade, even though he didn't believe in it. And I was saying, how can we make him the most important policeman in this country when he's promising us that he will be a hypocrite every day, that what he does will not be consistent with what he believes? He should not take the job because the laws are, he should try to change the laws before he works. So for a Muslim, if there are values, God wants you to be honest. So you have to be honest in your workplace, you have to be honest when you are a ruler, you have to be in private or public. So Islamic values are not quarantined in the private sphere, and therefore it's very, it's difficult to think of Muslims as secular individually. But as a country, what I'm arguing is that the state need not be theological. It can be secular in the sense it can give people the freedom to be Muslim or not to be a Muslim. It should be your choice. The state should not force you to be a Muslim. So you can have a state which provides the freedom to be. And that's where true faith matters because when you have freedom not to be a Muslim and you choose to be a Muslim, then your faith really matters. But if you are being a Muslim because you are afraid of being put in jail or being killed by the government, then what point is that faith? But Muslim groups should be willing to advocate for values. And I think it's very similar to the American model. Uh, you as a civil society institution are welcome to go out there and preach your faith and preach your values and even engage with politicians and say, this is the most beautiful way of doing. This is how we can solve our immigration problem. This is how we can solve our opioid problems or whatever. Uh, but they should not be forced by the state. That's my whole point. So in that sense, I do believe in a secular polity but a polity which is not that excludes religion out of the public sphere, but does not privilege religion either. Uh, how, 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 do you see, how do you see then Islamic values being expressed through this state uh, and that, for instance, that, that many Muslims may very well feel very comfortable with, as opposed to this very sharp um, separation that, that we we have here. I mean, it does seem as if Muslims want, in other countries, want to see their values, whatever it is, whether it's with Sharia law, whether it's the, the Hadith, whatever, whatever it is, somehow expressed and, and, and seen through, through see, the government. Take the United States, for example. Yeah. At the moment, there is nothing in American law or constitution that forces Muslims to do what Islam forbids. Okay, like for example, if Islam forbids me from consuming alcohol and eating pork, 
the American Constitution does not demand, the Chinese are demanding that Uyghurs should eat pork, but the U.S. doesn't demand that I drink alcohol mm -hmm. or, or drink pork. So there's nothing in American law that forces me to violate Islamic laws and Islamic values. And the contrary is also true. Everything that Islam requires me to do, which is to fast in the month mm -hmm. of Ramadan, pray, uh, be honest, etc., none of that is forbidden. In Islamic, in American law, so you can imagine a secular state dominated by non-Muslims, which is allowing Muslims to be Muslims, and also allowing Buddhists to be Buddhists and allowing Hindus to be Hindus. So that is, a, I think, the best model that uh, human humanity has discovered you know, on our <laughs> after thousands of years on this planet, and I think that 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 is okay with me, and I think that is a desirable state. But what I am arguing is that even this state can be violent, it can be national security obsessed sure. for imperial invading other societies. That is where the values, Islamic values can come in, and Muslim groups and other ethical groups can say, no, uh, our priority is not global domination, but our priority is uh, saving the planet, for example. We could take that as a, a... So that's where my discussion about thinking about national virtue rather than national interest uh, comes in. So yes, you're welcome to practice Islamic law as long as you don't enforce that on others, uh, but not make enforcing that law on others as the criteria for an Islamic society. Well, let me ask you this. Is there, a, is there a, then a contrast between what we say, for instance, see Islam in the Middle East as opposed to, say, Islam in Asia, where there doesn't seem to be necessarily this fusion of church and state? Well, or is that a correct view? I mean, I don't... There are culturally different types of manifestations. Like, for example, some scholars have tried to distinguish between Arab Islam and Persian Islam. So Persian society, or those societies influenced by Persian culture uh, have shown more proclivity towards aesthetics. For example, beautiful buildings, beautiful mosques, etc. Uh, there is lack of austerity and strictness, which is manifested in some of the Arab societies. For example, even in juristic schools within Islam, which the Arab ones are far more stricter than the ones which are there. Uh, and Sufi traditions uh, have arisen on the periphery of the Arab world. So yes, there is a cultural difference uh, across the world. Indonesian Islam is very different from Islam that is practiced in Senegal, for example. Pakistani Islam now varies significantly from Indian Muslims, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are cultural manifestations, and I think that is okay, because urf or custom is an important part of Islamic law. Muslims do a lot of things that Arabs used to do before Islam, and it became part of Islamic tradition. The problem is that Islamic scholars are obsessed with this whole idea of Islamic law, that they deliberately do not educate Muslim masses on other sources, on other aspects of Islamic law, and they try to hide that. For example, Ehsan is one of the most beautiful aspects of Islam, and in my book I show how even classical scholars have tried to hide it because they didn't want people to become mystical. They wanted to be, to be law-abiding, and you know. So, so that is, th there is this. And you can therefore see that uh, you have a state uh, like Pakistan, which with all its limitations is still democratic as opposed to Saudi Arabia, and both say that they are Islamic republics. So you have an elected president in Pakistan, and you have a monarchy in Saudi Arabia. So yes, there is diversity in Islamic Islam. That tells me one thing that there is no such thing as the Islamic. There's no the Islamic. There are many Islamic things, uh, societies, cultures, and states. And I'm trying to say among all of these, which is the most beautiful one, the one that privileges virtue over everything else. Uh, finally, the minutes uh, we have two we have left. Uh, one of the things that you um, offer up is this idea of uh, serving uh, as serving other people. And it was reminded, matter of fact, I was talking to a, a former clergyman who suggested that uh, the Good Samaritan story, as a matter of fact, it's just about that, about how God looks upon the Good Samaritan as someone who serves somebody else. You emphasize that a lot. So, for example, there is a Sufi saint in India called uh, Nizamuddin Awliya, and he said the whole purpose of human existence and the purpose of Islam is to do what you use the word, khidmat khalq service to humanity. So, so the, the, in the definition of what is beautiful, what is ihsan, 
it is stated that Ehsan is to worship God as if you see him. But the Arabic word worship also means service. It's the same word, to mm. serve God as if you see him. And therefore, since you can't see God and you can't directly serve God, you can serve his creation. And therefore, service to humanity and is like worship to God. And that is the most, I think, thing that Muslims should uh, focus on and all people should. If you want to be a good person, the best way you can be a good person is by being helpful to others. Um, my daughter once told me when she was a little young, she says, I don't like your sermons because you tell people to be good, to go to heaven. So I said, why do you help people? She said, I help people because they need help. And I realized that that, that was very beautiful. We've been speaking with Professor Muqtadr Khan. He is with the Political Science Department at the University of Delaware. He's written a new book called Islam and Good Governance, a Political Philosophy of Islam, and I appreciate you stopping by and chatting with us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Don. <laughs> Thank you. This has been Don Today. You. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening.